if you're all sitting comfortably, um, I will introduce Mike, who uh, Anne has sent me the, the details, Dr. Mike Allen. And it says, Mike Allen is a freelance environmental archeologist and visiting research fellow at Bournemouth University. Since 11 years old, he has been committed to archeology, span directing his own digs from 18. He worked for Wessex Archaeology for 20 years and then established his own consultancy 15 years ago, <laughs> which he says makes him feel very old. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> OK, well, anyway, here you are, Mike. I hand over to you. OK, thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Thank you very much, everyone, for inviting me to my lab to talk to you. Um, I'm sitting here in my purpose built laboratory which is an environmental archaeology laboratory. And I'm going to wander across the landscape of Southern Britain, telling you about the very landscape that we can see as archaeologists. My colleagues uh, deal with people in the past in terms of what they've produced, their constructions, their bones, and their artifacts. Um, all of those people in prehistory lived off the land. It was the landscape in which drove them and enabled them to survive. They were farmers and they lived off the land and therefore it's very important to understand what that landscape looked like. It, it doesn't look like or didn't look like the landscape we see today. It was very different. Um, the landscape had uh, more woodland in it. It was a completely different landscape. It ch it's changed its shape, its form. The rivers have changed. River valleys have changed, dry valleys have changed. The vegetation has changed dramatically. So if you put a prehistoric person back into the landscape today, they wouldn't recognize it. So what I'm trying to do is through archaeological science um, and using a number of different techniques, which I have specialists working for me doing things for, is to paint a picture of the landscape in which all of these sites sit. So we're going to look at three aspects of the landscape. We're going to look at the people and the communities, and they didn't just inhabit the sites, but they utilized its entire landscape and its resources. It was the larder and the food cabinet of society. The landscape's not just a simple stage in which they pass and, and communities performed. It's, they left their mark and their detritus. And it's a three-dimensional thing that's been molded and formed by the actions. So the landscape we see today is a result of prehistoric uh, and historic activity. And the landscape is not just sites that communities ut utilize. Um, and so we as archaeologists need to reconstruct the landscape. We need to go back into the past and see what the landscape was like in terms of its shape, its size, the resources, the animals, the vegetation, and see what past communities would have used. So what is a landscape perspective in environmental archaeology? I try and produce not huge detailed reports um, for my archaeological colleagues, but ultimately, ultimately from those reports, from those analyses, we want a site narrative, a story, if you like, of what happened in the past, and a wider interpretation, and a re-examination of not just the uh, environs of the site, but the whole landscape in which the site sits. And that may include mapping land use patterns over vast areas. And as soon as we are mapping things over any distance and looking at two dimensions um, and three dimensions, the amount of data we need increases exponentially. So in order to create a map of the land use patterns in the past, we may have to use 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, or 50 times as much data. And we want to have that not over space, but in the fourth dimension over time. So we want to see how those patterns change over time. So to start, one of the first patterns we must realize is that the environment and the climate that we sit in and enjoy today has not always been the same. Everyone talks about climatic warming and uh, man having created that, but the climate has always been changing. Before 10,000 BC, it was, a, it was glacial. And there were four glaciers before that. So we've had glaciers, interglaciers, glacial periods, and so forth. And since the last glacial period, we've had a whole series of epochs where it's become warmer. And then we've had birch and 
pine and juniper woodlands start to form from a scrub and a uh, savannah. And then that woodland moved into a mixed oak and hazel, and then into the climatic optimum, which would be um, the whole landscape of Northwest Europe essentially covered with a blanket of mixed deciduous oak woodland. And it isn't until the Neolithic to the Middle Bronze Age that we see the first significant impact, clearances by human beings, clearances for occupation, clearances for monuments, clearance for farming, clearance for herding animals, um, and coinciding with that, the elm decline. The elms disappear, possibly a result of Dutch elm disease. And then as we move into the later prehistory into the, uh, into the Roman Romano British period, we see it gets wet and there's a general deterioration. So we can see all these climate changes which are happening over, over the entire Northwest Europe, and they're the backdrop to our archaeology. We can't analyze that climate from one individual site. We have to look at that generally. So that's the last thing I'm going to do, talk about climate, but we just remember that that is a backdrop of things changing across time. But let's look at this as an illustration of archaeology and environmental archaeology. As an archaeologist or an environmental archaeologist, you want to reconstruct the post holes you see in the ground, the features you see, and reconstruct them. So as a mere archaeologist, you might want to have a look at the post holes from which you can reconstruct the house or the hut. You can look at other post holes from which you can reconstruct a hayrick or a smaller building other, and other subsidiary buildings around um, an enclosure which is ditched and banked. And these are all archaeological features we can recognise and reconstruct. The environmental archaeologist's task is a little grander, I would argue. He has to look at the woods in the distance which have been managed, coppiced and used as resources, not only to create the structures, but we need a tonne of wood a week to keep a fire going in that house. Um, that small farmstead is sustained by areas of arables. We need to know which areas have been farmed, how they've been farmed and what crops have been grown. There may be areas of fallow and pasture and rough pasture, areas of gardening, areas of managed uh, grassland, uh, hedgerows, rough pasture, grazed and trampled grassland, and ponds, uh, and secondary managed woodland. And together, the environmental archaeologist must therefore paint a picture of the landscape around the site. And so we start with things in nature, things which survive as part of the environment, such as soils. And this is a soil buried underneath a bronze age, a Neolithic barrow. That barrow dates to 37th century BC, 3700 BC. And here we can see the soil on which prehistoric man looked. That is different from the soils today, so we can analyse that through various techniques. We can look at alluvium in the river valleys, and here we are all agreeing with Professor Rob Scape and creating a picture, a profile of the landscape beneath our feet near Darrington Walls. The river is down over here today, but in the past we can see where my cursor goes, the river once existed where the floodplain now is. And we have dates of 8000 BP in that floodplain, suggesting this is a Mesolithic landscape here, um, which has then become infilled. So the landscape has physically changed. Rivers have moved, valleys have been filled. And one of the other classic features we see as archaeologists is a lynchet. This is a bank which is built up as a result of tillage upslope, arrested at the field edge, and hill wash, plough wash, or colluvium has accumulated against the field boundary gradually over time. So although this deposit here looks like a single layer, it represents several thousand years of gradual accumulation. And during that time, the environment has changed, the land use has changed from a woodland one to a pasture one to an arable one and back to pasture again. And we can look at other deposits such as this, where we have three meters of sediment building up in a dry valley, which you can't see today. I'm going to come back to that. And that's colluvium, filling up valleys, changing the shape of the landscape. But that hill wash there, three meters of hill wash, dates from 9,000 BC to today, and so that gives us an 11,000 year record of the past environment. So how do we get our data? 
most of our data, unlike our architecture colleagues, is microscopic or macroscopic. So we can't go to an archaeological excavation, pick up an artifact and put it into a finds tray. Most of it has to be collected by a sampling. So we must take samples, we must process those samples in a specific way to get a specific type of item out. And archaeologists sometimes just take general bags of soil to give to the archaeological scientists and say, here, tell us what's in it. That shows a lack of thought and knowledge. You need to take specific samples to answer specific questions using specific data. And I'll rumble through a number of those quickly in a minute to give you a flavour of the types of things we can, we can do. And here is a rather complicated diagram, but it just shows that if we take a soil sample, we can put it into water and we can swash it around. And if we then sieve it at a coarse residue, like half a millimetre or so, we can take out plant macrofossils, mollusks, land snails, and small moan, bones. If we sieve it to a finer fraction with paraffin, we might get insect fragments out. We might get waterlogged seeds and ostracods. Um, and if we use a different method of processing, um, we might be able to get pollen and so forth out. And that's not through process, not through sieving, but through a mechanism of laboratory processing. And that's very different from the other coarse sieving that we might use on site to get big goodies and artifacts like bones and large shells and artifacts. But when we add both sides together, what they do is they paint the picture of the landscape and the environment in the past. And so both archaeologists and environmental archaeologists have the same goal. I'll start with pollen. Very briefly, pollen is one of the most ubiquitously widespread analytical techniques. They are the little elements of plants which are blown around in the wind literally or can be fluttering off. Uh, almost every single vegetation will have pollen and they are specific to each species. We can recognize them and they are mega microscopic. Um, so they have to be identified, uh, sorry, extracted in the variety using heavy techniques and very, very small samples taken in the field. The advantage is that they tell us about the vegetation in the, in the immediate landscape, the near landscape and the far landscape. So they are ideal for looking at the environment and land use over, in the time, over, over time. And I'm particularly interested not in the landscape, but land use, because that invokes people. If I was interested in landscape, I'll be a paleogeographer. I'm a paleoenvironmentalist, an environmental archaeologist, a geoarchaeologist. I'm interested in what people are doing in the past. Pollen is marvellous. We can collect it by sampling with an auger, and from that auger, we can just cut out little slices of sample like this to take back to the laboratory for analysis. The problem with pollen is on landscapes that you're studying, the Cotswolds, or the landscape I study, such as the Chalklands of southern England and northwest Europe, pollen doesn't survive. It's very robust, but it won't survive on chalklands and base rich geologies. So we're somewhat stymied. But the advantage of pollen is through time, you can look at a number of samples stacked up over time and see how the different species come and go and the vegetation changes. So this is at Darrington Walls and we can see woodland is starting off with and then a whole series of very open countries. So I'm not going to go into that detail, but that's just one method that we can use. If you use the right analyst, sometimes in areas which are particularly difficult, we can find pollen. But on the whole, pollen won't survive on chalklands or limestones. The other thing which is used very regularly in archaeology is uh, mass bulk flotation in order to recover charred plant remains. Charred plant remains and charcoal are the most ubiquitous item that my environmental or archaeological colleagues use. It's big bags of soil, buckets of soil placed into drums of water, water sploshed around and the material then uh, floats off and is caught into a sieve. And then as all the charcoal floats off, that can be analysed. This is just a whizzy one that I designed at Wessex Archaeology, which has an internal drum, and an internal weir. So the water comes in through here, is swished around, goes through a tap and back round again to circulate so that the sieve is internal. So instead of having an external sieve, the sieve is internal. The advantage of this is that it takes about half an hour to empty the tank and refill it with water. So with this tank, while this tank is going, I can make my operator sort this tank out, get this tank ready. By the time this tank is ready to go, this one can be switched off, taps turned, 
on the next one process. So it's just a way of keeping my operator busy all the time. But this is the type of thing that we might find in a good sample. This is full of thousands of charred grain, of charred chaff, of charred plant remains from which we can in interpret the economy and the landscape, whether the charcoal represents domestic fires or, or hearths. We can identify the charcoal by the, the biological patterns and the fragments that we see under the microscope. And we can identify what the species are and work out whether it's open woodland, closed woodland, deciduous woodland, coniferous woodland, mature woodland, secondary woodland, and so forth. The child plant remains, the seeds tell us what crop was growing, but the weed seeds tell us what time of year it was cultivated, what soils it was cultivated on, and also the chaff then tells us whether it's been processed on site for consumption, processed on site for storage, or processed on site for market. But then we're going to talk about land snails. We're going to talk a bit about land snails because that's my speciality. And you know, I've written this little book on snails in archaeology. Um, and so we'll talk a bit about snails. And snails are something that we hope that will be surviving uh, in the Cotswolds and will be surviving on the Sisters Barrow. But I'll be talking about it at the end of this talk. But land snails survive all the way across the classic areas of Wessex from uh, Sussex right way through to Hampshire. Wiltshire, Dorset, sites of Stonehenge, Avery all lie on the chalk and so we lie on land snails. Land snails are microscopic. Um, and here in this tube, you won't be able to see them, are some very, very large ones. They are half a millimetre in size by the time I get them. Look at your ruler in a minute and have to see how big half a millimetre is. The answer is very small. The reason we're interested in land snails is their shells survive but different species like living in different habitats. So some of them will live in a woodland habitat where there's shade and leaf litter for them to live in and eat. Some of them are Catholic, that's nothing to do with their religion, it means they don't care where they live. Some of them are open country, but within the open country, some will like long grassland and some short grassland. And you'll know if you've ever walked up onto the downs or up into the, uh, onto the moors and you sat down on a sunny day on short grass and it's fine. But on the other hand, if you sit down on long grass on that same sunny day, you will find you have a wet derriere. And the snails know this because it's the moisture in the bottom of the grass that they're hiding in from the sun. And some of the, some snails were like living in snails were like living in rock rubble habitats. Now, every single one of these species here can live in either woodland and Catholic, open country, or rock rubble habitats. But it's the proportions. So by looking carefully at the proportions of the species, we can determine what the environment was like. And if we look at a number of samples stacked up through a sequence over time, we can see how that landscape changed and how man and people and communities have changed, modified and created the landscape they live. Now, the snails that you see are probably the common garden snail, but most of the snails I look at are microscopic. So we can't pick them by hand. We have to take soil samples out of the field and process them. And here's just a little graph showing you on an excavation of people picking up shells by hand. And these are the species they found. Um, this one here is the banded snail that you might know. This one here looks like a whelk. Um, and this is one of the biggest banded flat snails. But when you take a, a bag of soil about the size of a sugar bag, one or two kilograms, and process it out, and the next two slides will show us that, you'll see that the amounts of snails that are in there are completely different. Not only are there hundreds more, but many species that are not represented by hand picking are there. And this is more representative of the prehistoric or the historic environment. So that's what the Roman snail, the garden snail looks like, this one here. Um, and at the same scale, an unbroken, these are adult shells of different species. And when I get them as an archeologist, we just have this fragment here, this fragment here, and this fragment here, which we can identify. So it's time consuming and boring. So how do we take our samples? Well, we go into the field, we have to read the archeology. span We have to read the sections. And this section here, which is of a Neolithic causewood enclosure um, uh, in the Dorchester area, I can tell you something about the landscape without even going into the laboratory. 
at the base here, we have a turf, immediately telling me that when this ditch was dug, it was dug through a turf, open grass and soil, and that turf fell off and rolled into the ditch. The ditch sides weathered here probably over 60 to 100 years, bringing in all the chalk weathering from the sides. And then we had, and that would occur over the decadal scale. The next fill is this colluvial soily fill, which is, which is occurring over the centurial scale. Mm -hmm. And then at the very top, we can see this upper fill, the tertiary fill, which is occurring over the millennial scale. So we can look at all these and then we take our samples. And these are holes where I've taken samples, but we start off at the bottom. We take a sample from the bottom here and then another one above it, and then another one above that. And slowly we're building them up through time. So I'm taking this through the turf at the base, which has fallen in, through the primary fills, up into the base fills. And then I move into here where the fills are thicker. And through this, so I'm getting the best picture of that landscape over time. So if this is Neolithic, might be uh, uh, 3,500 or so BC, the top of it is medieval. So I have got four or 5,000 years of environmental land use history. And the samples look like this, just bags of soil, which have been carefully taken in the field, carefully labeled, and then moved back to the lab. And then we deal with them in a very scientific manner. Um, we play, mud pies. We tip them to buckets, swirl them around, perhaps add a little chemical to help break down the clays, and then we tip it out into a sieve. And so here you can see all the soil being tipped out into a half millimetre mesh sieve. <coughs> Anything larger than half millimetre is kept in that sieve, and here you can see charcoal and those white blobs of snails. And that might be easy, so we might think, okay, I can take away that plot, here is one here, um, which you can just about see some snails in there. Mm. There's the plot, and I can then start working. However, unfortunately, the snails aren't quite that kind to me because most of them are smashed up, and most of them are in this mess here. So I have to tip all the stones through a stack of sieves of four millimeter, two millimeter, one millimeter, and half millimeter, and dry them. And then I have to sort through every single grain a stone here, every single grain of stone here, every single grain of stone here, and pull out all the land snails. But from that information, we can start painting pictures of what the landscape looked like in the past. And this is the landscape of the Avebury area and Winmore Hill. And this is not mine, but this is the work of uh, some of John Evans's students in Cardiff, where they've been able to do lots of different analysis from the ditch fills and slowly create a picture that this monument here of a causewood enclosure of the 36th century BC in the Avery landscape was built in a woodland which was cleared for that monument. And we know that you can see other monuments from it. So we could suggest that the monuments of Horslip, South Street and West Kennet Long Barrows, which are about a century earlier, could be seen. And therefore we can see that there must have been areas of woodland cleared, so you can see that. So we're starting to create pictures of what the landscape would look like how people would live in that landscape. But they can also tell um, stories of sites and human activity. So here is uh, a Bronze Age barrow in Basingstoke, excavated by an amateur archaeological group um, in the late 60s and early 70s. They're excavating it in advance for housing estate. And there's a Bronze Age barrow. You can just about see a ditch here. And here's all the stake holes they found in the middle. They took a number of soil samples. Here's the, the barrow ditch and the stake holes in the center. The stake holes had a burnt area in the middle and a buried soil. So by looking at the samples that they took and presented to me, we could create one of these. You're gonna see a couple of these, I'm sorry, they're very really boring, but I'll tell you how to read them. This is a land snail diagram. On the left is the, is the soil sequence. So this is the ditch fill and layers older than ditch. So this is the oldest and this is the newest. And here are the different species of snails. But more interestingly, here is the summary and the answers. But if we look at the black boxes, they tell you the proportion of the shells. So you can see that this particular species increases in time, whereas this one decreases in time. And what this means is that when this barrow was constructed, well before it was constructed, it was constructed in woodland. Oh, sorry, it, 
woodland existed well before it was considered. When it was constructed, however, the buried soil through which the ditch was cut was already a well-established open grassland. Therefore, this barrow was not constructed in a woodland which had been cleared for it. The woodland had been cleared before it, hundreds of years before. And then the Bronze Age barrow was created and the ditch started to infill. And all of my colleagues, I always see these chalk ditches were, these chalk barrows were white, gleaming chalk mounds to be seen across the landscape. They were revered for centuries. Um, well, I'm afraid that's cobblers because the lands now show that within decades, it, the whole ditch grew over with open scrub and woodland. And therefore the ditch, the barrow was constructed, uh, activities were performed, rituals were performed, and then the monument was created and they went away and left it. Only later, hundreds of years later, but still in the Bronze Age, did people clear it and then they put inhumations into it. They thought, oh yes, this is a monument of our ancestors. They cleared it, created short turf and put their ancestors in it in the Middle Bronze Age. And then again, they went away. So by the Iron Age, it was grown over with refugia and brambles and so forth. And it was only in the Roman period that it started to be ploughed flat and removed from the landscape. So there are the snails. I've told us quite a picture of what this barrow was doing in the landscape and its history, which adds to the archaeological story. But we can look at this in broader landscape pictures. So here is a hillside, and at the bottom of the slope, there is a large amount of hill wash. And at the top of the hill, just about, is a Bronze Age barrow just offside here. That barrow was excavated, and we took a load of snails from it, which again shows that it was constructing an open woodland clearing. The ditch soon grew over with scrub, um, and then it was only later cleared and open fields um, in the Iron Age and Roman periods. And that creates a little myopic picture of the area around that barrow. And if we move down slope, this here is soil which has washed down slope as a result of deforestation, as a result of tillage, as a result of clearance, as a result of human activity. And has built up for several meters thick um, through here, burying the soil. And when this was ex exposed, I climbed up a 42 foot ladder and took these samples. And at the bottom, we found Bronze Age and Beaker pottery. Then we found Iron Age pottery and Roman pottery in the section. And from looking at the snails, we can see it was woodland and it was progressively cleared. Then we had an open country phase, which, which we equate to our barrow, a woodland regeneration phase equating to the activity of the barrow. And then the area moved from one a landscape, which was cultivated by Ard, and then later, one that was ploughed um, and cultivated by a plough that turns the sod. And they create two different environments that our land snails can detect or live in differently. And we can detect those two different environments. So here again, a picture of landscape change over time. I'm now going to talk a little bit about formation process and taphonomy. It's not quite as boring as this slide fix because we're going to talk about hill wash, colluvium. For those of you who know Latin, col meaning hill, so it's stuff from the hill. It's the soil that's washed off the hill and has ended up at the bottom of the hill. Why? Well, it's probably due to human action, human intervention. What does hill wash look like? All my textbooks told me that it, it moved down the hill slowly, gradually, rhythmically, and almost imperceptibly. Well, that's cobblers, because here we have hill wash occurring. This occurred at 11.30 one evening on the 14th of September, 1984, and 600 tonnes of soil came off that field within a space of a couple of hours. Building up uh, is a whole series of different types of soil and burying the landscape. And also underneath here is my backfield excavation. It created areas of mud, areas of gravel, areas of chalk rubble, which sometimes we can find on archeological sites like this. So we can see the landscape processes. And they also build up in lynchets. It's the same process. The problem with a lynchet like this is this all looks like one layer. So how do we date it? Unlike an archaeological site which has clear stratigraphy, we can recognize different layers. Hill wash, colluvium is relatively uniform. Where does one layer stop and another start? Where does one period start? How do we date it? We can use extrinsic data, such as artifacts, 
But if we've looked at this, this might be called context one. So all of our artifacts from Neolithic to Roman would end up in the same pine tree. We could try looking at intrinsic data and dating it through archaeomagnetic dating or OSL, but that's very time consuming and the results are really quite poor from this type of deposit. Or we could start looking at the distribution of artifacts, not where did they come from in the layer, but by plotting each individual artifact carefully, we then get a mass of artifacts. And if we do clever maths, we can actually work out the central line between those artifacts and show that that lynch it at Bishopstone. The Neolithic and the Bronze Age lines follow the land surface. But the Iron Age ceramics, Roman ceramics, and Anglo-Saxon ceramics follow the lynchit form. Therefore, this was this lynchit was built up in the Bronze Age and then successionally through the Iron Age and Roman period. But landscapes are dynamic, and we can see that Hill Wash not only builds up in lynchits, but builds up in the valleys sometimes covering meters and meters of the valleys. And here is a site um, in Sussex near Lewis at Ashkeen Bottom, where we're excavating uh, the intersection of two valleys. You can see one, this valley here, but we're also in a dry valley here. We're looking at the hill wash that's built up at the base of this, really to look at the landscape and the environmental history. However, it eroded two months after the end of the excavation, and some of those deposits there, we can actually see as analogues for deposits that occurred in the Bronze Age. And here they are. There is a chalk rubble, sorry, a flint rubble fan, which is exactly what exists underneath here. We can see in here strings of chalk, lenses of chalk in here, which is the sort of things which occur here. And here, these deposits here are beaker, 2500 BC, Bronze Age and Iron Age. So the environments, the, the, the deposits that occur there are exactly the same that occurred in 1984. And so we can look at that as analogues to say what the landscape was like. When we look at the distribution of artifacts, we had a slight surprise. We found a vast quantity of beaker artifacts. Beaker is a early Bronze Age vessel form, which is very diagnostic. And there are no settlement sites known or very few settlement sites known in Southern England. And yet this hole, which was just plonked in the middle of a field because I wanted to dig some soil, came across what is almost definitely a beaker settlement site. And all of these stars, red stars, indicate beaker pottery, all sitting on a buried soil upon which were a series of ard marks. So this is the location of a beaker settlement. It was unknown because if we looked at it from the surface today, there's nothing on the surface, it's nearly a metre down. It's, there's, you can't detect it through geophysics, you can't detect it through field walking, you can't detect it through aerial photography. Which gets me to the, to the understanding of having a look at things like valleys and the valley landscapes. If we look at dry valleys today, uh, on the downs and on the Cotswolds, they are places we can walk through. They are areas which are slightly more sheltered, they create avenues and, and directions through the, through the valleys, through the, through the landscape. And so people would have herded animals through them. They'd have walked through them, but also they would have lived in them because they're more sheltered. And here is a valley in the Salisbury landscape um, near Potter, that in the Devizes landscape. And here you can see the slope today, but when we excavated it, here is that three meters of hill wash. And so this valley is entirely infilled with soils eroded down as a result of human beings over the past 9,000 years, 12,000 years. And in this very small excavation, we can see we found a ditch, a pit, a buried soil, another buried soil, evidence of a pot smashed on there. And also you can see over time, the soil goes from this dark color to lighter, and lighter and lighter as more and more chalk is incorporated in it. And that's telling me that the soils in the past were dark, rich, fertile, not very chalky, because they were thick, perhaps two or three foot thick. And as the soils have eroded into valleys like this, they have become thinner. The chalk has become incorporated in them until they become the chalky, thin, uh, unusable soils we see today. And there's the 
the section as we are taking samples for it. Samples being taken here, and this is a column of 36 samples being taken for land snails right way through here, representing 9, 10, 11,000 years of history, and small soil samples being taken for soil micromorphology. That's a technique where we take the soil out, and unlike other techniques where we break the soil up, I mean, buckets of water and, and sieve out material, those soils are kept intact as blocks of soil like this. They're taken away and impregnated in resin. The resin takes three or four months to dry. And when it's dried um, in a vacuum pump, so it's sucked into every single pore in the soil, it's then sliced with a diamond saw, stuck onto a, a glass slide, polished in my day by hand down to 20 microns and looked at under a microscope. And there we can see evidence of the morphology, the shape, the microstructure, the micromorphology of the soils. We can work out whether they've been ploughed in the past, whether the soil was a thick soil or a thin soil, whether it was a grass and soil or woodland soil, whether there's evidence of burning, of deforestation, trampling and so forth. And they will all be stratified, that evidence will be stratified not only within the soil itself, but within little holes and bugs and vesicles within the soil. So that's providing us another whole raft of history. So returning to these dry valleys, this is the dry valley I excavated as a schoolboy um, in Eastbourne. Uh, here we have a young man, Martin Bell, describing the soils and teaching me what to do. He's now a professor at Reading University, Professor Martin Bell. And we're looking at those sites there because once we had a look at the distribution of artifacts once again we found another prehistoric site buried under hillwash in the valley where archaeologists don't look where archaeologists can't see because they are hidden by hillwash so let's just consider why archaeologists don't look in these places i have now found evidence of something like 20 or 30 sites buried in dry valley locations right there across southern england from kent to Dorset um, and Devon. Um, and archaeologists are fickle people. If they go out and find stuff, they'll look more. If they look, find an area of the blank, they'll ignore it. So let's just have a look at a landscape and see how a landscape pro progresses. Let's just create a hypothetical landscape with a hill slope, hilltop, a slope, and a valley bottom. And let's cover it with artifacts. Let's just throw artifacts all over that landscape so there's a uniform distribution of artifacts all over that site. So if I dug a test pit, I find two on the surface and the same quantity in both test pits at the top of the hill as in the bottom of the hill. And they'd both be the same depth, 15 centimetres in here. If I now then erode it, so I take trees off it, or I subject it to agriculture, the soil, but not the artifacts, will move down slope and accumulate in the bottom. So the density of artifacts will increase upslope, and the density of artifacts will decrease downslope. And downslope, some artifacts not only has the density decreased, but some may be buried. So when the jolly old archaeologist comes along to this site, he finds lots of artifacts at the top of the hill, which is where he continues to do his investigations and test pitting and excavation, none at the bottom of the hill, so he walks away. How wrong was he? If we look at this little example, we can see we have in areas of erosion, areas of colluvium, hill wash, areas of alluvium. And if we look at the distribution of artifacts in plan, we can see we have got prehistoric, Roman and medieval remains on the hill slope. At the foot slope, we just have Roman and medieval, and in the valley bottom, we have medieval. And this is exactly how Hoskins described the British landscape and the evolution of the British landscape of prehistoric people living up in the wilds on the hilltops and more civilised people in the medieval period coming down into the valleys and occupying things. But let's look at that picture slightly more carefully. There's those three distributions. But if we dissect that, let's have a look at the real distribution of those artefacts, not on the surface, but within the soils. We can see that actually prehistoric flints occur in the soil here, under the colluvium here, and under the alluvium here. So prehistoric people were looking, were living in the entire landscape. So let's look at the Roman pottery distribution. The Roman is on the hill slope, over the colluvium and under the alluvium. And it's only the medieval pottery, the medieval remains, that are on the entire surface. 
Therefore, that's why we need to understand landscapes. We need to dig test fits. We need to understand that to recreate the landscape in the past. So Gerard Hoskins could just see what we see on the surface, but archaeologists and geoarchaeologists can look at that and look at the tree landscape. And that's what my job is. So now let's do that. Let's use some of these tools, the snails, the soils, the landscape archaeology, and walk out into the landscape and have a look at areas of the chalkland um, and show why geoarchaeology and environmental archaeology is key to some of the archaeological questions. So I'm going to be looking at four areas of the chalk, but just two in detail. We will mention Avery. We'll look at Stonehenge. I'm going to look at Cranbourne Chase. And I'll just mention Maiden Castle at the end. So these are good places to play as an archaeologist. They are the areas of the densest mesolithic and lithic flint scatters on the chalk. They are all areas with major neolithic monuments, you know, maybe castles, of course, enclosure, and bank barrow, Cranbourne and Chase is stuffed full of neolithic monuments and henges, Stonehenge, well, I don't need to tell you any more about that, Stonehenge, Darrington, the Mayfrey, obvious. So let's just play in those landscapes because they're full of archaeology. Um, and now we have always worked in these landscapes, assuming that a whole area is covered in post-glacial woodland and prehistoric man has cleared that woodland. John Evans did the first work in this landscape with his seminal book, Land Snails and Archaeology, 1972, my Bible. Um, and from the work he did on there, he proved the chalklands, just like everywhere else in Northwest Europe, was covered in woodland, just that he didn't have pollen to play with, so he had to use snails. And so this is the, some of the pictures we think of, the early Neolithic monuments clearing and hewing openings in that woodland to create openings for pasture, for monuments, and for living. And then that woodland was progressively cleared over time as more and more monuments came and more and more people looked at that. So let's look at the Stonehenge landscape. We can do this by looking at the pollen, which we do have at the Darrington Valley, um, where we can see on this here, we have evidence of woodland down at the bottom. Um, this is dating to 8,000, 7,000 BC. So this is Mesolithic woodland moving into the early Neolithic period and then into an open landscape. So we can see that landscape being opened by prehistoric people. Yeah, you can see that open landscape, all the woodland here has disappeared. And then we'll just look at another monument and another Neolithic monument at Conabry, which is on the hillside just above Stonehenge. The bottom of the ditch didn't have many snails in it, but halfway up the ditch, there are loads of snails here. See, these are all the woodland ones up on the left-hand side, all the open country ones on the right-hand side. So this ditch here existed in uh, a woodland, or this is evidence of secondary woodland regeneration. So we're starting to get a picture that some of these early Neolithic monuments were built in a woodland and it was cleared for them and for the communities who were using them. The Stonehenge ditch analysed by John Evans has exactly the same picture. There's his samples through the ditch. Look at all these woodland snails, billions of woodland snails, evidence that there was woodland there in the past and um, it was only that landscape was created as the downland and open downland by prehistoric people. So by looking at samples at Darrington, Woodhenge, the Greater Cursus, the Avenue and Stonehenge, we can start creating pictures of what this landscape looked like. And this is me being a very young, very naive and very honest archaeologist in the early 1990s, working with Julian Richards. Um, he'd done all the work in this area, so I created a picture of what the landscape looked like over time. And the reason I said honest, young and naive is because I decided that I would only create an interpretation where I had data. So you'll notice that these little interpretations of uh, these areas of woodland and these areas of grassland and these areas of arable are actually in little circles because they're around sites and data points. So if we look at this, this is the early Neolithic. I have evidence of woodland, woodland here and open grassland over these monuments. But we have more important, we have evidence of woodland to start it off. As we move into the later Neolithic, we have evidence of wooden regeneration and more evidence of open grassland. And so what we think we're looking at is the areas of open grassland being opened up within that ancient woodland. And the reason we're not getting pictures of the woodland is because there are no archaeological sites there. We don't have sites in the woodland. We have sites having, showing evidence of the removal of that woodland. So by the time we move to the early Bronze Age, we can see quite a lot of it opened up. And by the later Bronze Age, we can not only see um, open grass and we can start seeing evidence of arable landscapes and farm stages. So we can see this progression and we're starting to map 
land use over time. But behind it all is the woodland that we can't see. And so I moved on uh, in 1995 and 1997 to look at this landscape again with more data that we've got from a number more sites. And here you can see very, very rich. Each one of these stars represents um, a site with, it, with environmental analysis and land smells. And each one of those sites might represent two, three, four, five, or six months of analysis of for land snails alone. When we build that up, we, we assume that we have the woodland there in the first place because that is what occurs all over Northwest Europe. And we are removing that woodland where we have evidence of clearance, where we have evidence of grass. And so here is that landscape in the early Mesolithic. So I've put a early Mesolithic open birch hazel woodland that we know from the climate exists. And I've cleared bits of it where I have my environmental evidence from post pits. And then I, with a bit of um, imagination, cleared a bit around some of the sites near Durrington Walls and around the woodland. And I've just created create another random clearances around a, a Mesolithic, uh, uh, around a, a Mesolithic flint scatter and in another area to show that these, there are other monuments and other areas that you can see. And as we move over time, so now we're moving into the 4,000, 3,000 BC, the first stages of Stonehenge, we can see that woodland starting to be removed. We can see the oak, hazel and elm woodland, which is now in the grey, being removed. Some areas of secondary woodland, areas of grazed grass, and areas of floodplain. And as we move over time, we can see the area becoming more open. And some of my analysis is, predictive, is by predictive looking at artifact scatters. So if these artifact scatters are over these areas, I can suggest they are open. I've got areas of arable plots. And so over time, we can see this landscape changing into the landscape by the later Bronze Age, a really one that we can almost recognize today. So if we go back, you can see the landscape becoming progressively deforested. And that follows these climatic zones that I showed you right at the beginning, moving from juniper, birch, pine woodland through hazel woodland, but here, this land and plains, this clearance phase, and a removal and clearance of that woodland. So let's just look at this later Mesolithic climatic optimum, because everywhere in all of these slides, we've it's predicated by the evidence that there's woodland there. John Evans, his entire research, this entire book, is based on the fact that he's proven that there's woodland on the chalklands right there across uh, Northwest Europe. So let's have a look at that slightly more closely and with perhaps slightly more open minds. We're going to look at the early monuments, such as the Mesolithic monuments and the early Neolithic monuments. The early Neolithic monuments in this landscape are the Long Barrows, because they, have been, they start at 37th century BC. We'll have a look at a couple of these things. There's the Amesbury Long Barrow, constructed in 37th century BC. We just dig a hole through the turf, here is the bank of that barrow and here's the buried soil underneath. Is there anything you can spot? Well, that's not a thick soil. That's not three foot thick. That's not very dark. In fact, it looks to me rather like this soil here. The soil underneath the barrow is a Renzina soil. It's the soil we have on the landscape today. That's a landscape which doesn't have woodland. That's a grass and landscape. Just by looking at this photograph without doing any analysis, this is evidence of an open grass and landscape before people moved into the landscape. The age B42 Long Barrow is the first monument in this landscape, and it wasn't wooded. The, the land snail evidence shows it existed in dry open grass and right way through. There was that one area of scrub which regenerated in the ditch, but the buried soil says this, this was an open grass and landscape, and there was no wooden there. So this is actually one of John Evans' slides that he used to, to show his students how stupid the general public were. And because this is a, a comment saying, the, the prehistoric man saying to his son, when I was a lad, all this was fields. Because as far as John was concerned, that was wrong. When, the, when, the, when this landscape was old, um, it would have been full of woodland. But in fact, perhaps we're wrong. Let's just go to Cranbourne Chase and do the same thing. Let's look at the early monuments in Cranbourne Chase. Bang, there's the land snails, bop. No wooden snails at the bottom. Bang, no wooden snails at the bottom of this one. Let's look at the Dorset Curses. Okay, it's a bit later. Doesn't matter where we look at it, probably in a number of places. 
the buried soil and the primary fill. No wooden snails, no wooden snails. Once again, where's the woodland gone? Perhaps that's not the question we should be asking. The question is, where, why wasn't there ever woodland here? And we go to Knowlton, another big monument in the area, the same picture. Now let's go back to some of the pollen diagrams. If we look at them carefully, there's very few trees here. These are open landscapes. This is completely different to what we've been taught. This means all of my textbooks, I've got a shelf of textbooks here, they're all wrong. I can rip all these books up, they're all wrong. Um, our starting point needs to be re-evaluated. And we can partly re-evaluate it through models created by Vera, who suggests that not everywhere was, considered, was covered in a dense woodland, but that woodland was variable and that it would die back and break open. And when it broke open, we might get animals moving in, grazing it, and that would maintain it as open. So we'd get natural open places, not clearings, natural openings in the landscape. And if we look at that um, in a natural opening, we'll get not completely open, we'd have woodland in, nearby, but we'd also have more animals moving in. We'd have more berries growing, more fruit, more vegetation growing. So the landscape would be more diverse. We'd have berries and soft fruit. We'd have hazel, which is a shrub, not a tree. And we'd have woodland in the area. So animals and ungulates would move into that area to browse and graze. The cattle are, graze, are browsers, not grazers. Um, they only graze because we make them um, eat grass because it's easier for us. And so these landscapes were then maintained as open areas by prehistoric animals. And if you're a human being or a human community, what a wonderful place to come into, an area which is already open, but there's plenty of woodland. And those are the landscapes that they would be first settling. Out of all of the thousands of pieces of analysis from Dorset to Kent, we've been able to identify four in the whole of the country. I've looked at hundreds of work sites, hundreds of samples in, in Sussex and in Hampshire, they don't exist there. The four site areas are Maiden Castle, Cranbourne Chase, Stonehenge and Avebury. That's why those four areas are the centres of prehistoric archaeology. So the way forward is not to look at simple site narratives, but look at the whole landscape. Look at landscape over time and space. And we need a new generation of environmental archaeologists who can engage with human action and not just vegetation history. Now I'm going to finish off by bringing you back to your landscape. I've only been there a couple of minutes. We're just going to look at barrows such as Hailson Long Barrow and the Sisters Long Barrow. These are difficult landscapes for me as an environmental archaeologist because you're really in the twilight zone. Pollen doesn't survive here, but because it's hard limestone, the soils aren't very chalky and very calcareous, so snails don't survive. Or if they do, they survive in very small pockets. But we do find them. And here is Martin Bell's work at um, Hamilton Hill, uh, sorry, <laughs> at Hayston Long Barrow. And here we can see he's got evidence of open woodland and scrubland. And he's suggesting from this that this was built in a woodland and then cleared. Um, this is taking him lots of samples to do. Um, and therefore, he's created a picture by showing that as, as the woodland was cleared, the valleys filled up with hill wash on both sides of the soils eroded. But if we look at the Sisters Barrow, which we're now starting to look at very carefully, we need to ask our question is that? shady environment we see at the base, evidence of woodland, or should we be looking at it again and saying it's evidence for open scrubland, and that's all that existed. And if it was an open scrubland environment, this creates an environment which is ideal for living in, easier to clear, it's not far from dense woodland, it's an area which animals would roam and graze and browse and be ideal for people to live in. So at the Sisters Barrow, we are looking at soil samples, and here is a soil sample being taken for soil microbiology. We're looking at land snails. So there's the column being taken for land snails through some of the ditches and the quarry ditches. And here there are all the land snail samples being set out just outside my lab in my garage, being the notes being taken, ready to be processed. And the results, was it built in a recently cleared woodland? Was the woodland cleared long before for pre activity? Or was there ever any woodland? These are our major questions. Or did it survive in an always open landscape? 
These are the questions we have to ask, and they make a huge difference to how Professor Tim Darvel interprets the activity of that monument. Or was it perhaps left to be a mass of brambles and overgrown? Well, the answer is, I don't know. Watch this space. There are months of analysis to come. The samples are being processed and the next part of the story. So and that's what I'll be working on over the summer and so forth. And so in time, we'll have a story for the Sisters Barrow, which we're going to tease out as soil micropology, possibly pollen, as well as landstones. And at that point, I will end. But I'll end on an invitation. Um, I've not been able to be there with you. So normally I'll bring my microscopes, I'll have my snails, I'll have charcoal, I'll also have augers and various things to show you. So instead of me coming to you, um, I'm writing you as two groups to collectively come, if you wish, to come and have a look at the lab, to have a look at uh, augers and my, I have a whole range of augers and we can do some augering, look at the flotation system, look at land snails down the microscopes here. I'll do a demonstration of processing and you can look at soil microbiology seeds and charcoal. We can do that. There's a largest garden here, so you can sit in the garden, you can drink tea or coffee and have cocoa boilers, so you can do that. Um, and that may be anything you'd like to do. The only other thing I can add to that is um, where I'm sitting now, I'm 15 minutes away from that pile of stones. I wouldn't want to take you to those stones, you can do that yourself, but I can take you to the Stonehenge landscape and we could visit the landscape, go onto King Barrow Ridge, look, walk over the barrow that I excavated and walk down the avenue in the processional way and see I can discuss the landscape with you and you can have a look at how Stonehenge would have looked to prehistoric people and see why the avenue is where it is. That's an option. You can take it up if you wish. If you don't, I won't be offended. Um, you may want to do it this year, next year. That's just an invitation to you as a whole. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mike, before everybody else comes in. A fascinating talk. Um, as somebody who's um, supposed to be partly a farmer, partly economist and various other things, and having worked in a lot of countries, I'd be very interested if you could uh, show if there's a relationship between the type of soils that we're talking about. The areas that you were talking about were mainly limestone, I think, yeah. uh, you know, in, in, in that region. And of course, in Sussex, a lot of it is clay. Um, is there a fairly close relationship between the open countryside and the, you know, basic material, the soils and geology, um, and the same in places like Sussex and Kent? No, is the answer. No. Oh, right. Essentially, right. it's an ecological um, quirk. Um, in the, on the chalklands of Sussex, where we have chalk with no clay, we might yeah. have soils which are two or three foot thick, dark, loamy soils in pre which have eroded into the valleys. On the clay, they may be slightly denser. In areas of Hampshire, in areas of Wiltshire, we'd also have soils which are two foot thick. Um, and we think that in the Cotswolds, from the evidence from uh, Houston and Longbarrow, the soils are brown earth soils, which are a foot or two foot thick. So they are all soils that are much thicker than those we see today, much loamier, uh, much siltier, much more prone to erosion, much more fertile, and would have been covered in woodland of one type or another. Put your hand up. The problem with them is, as soon as you remove the woodland and you expose these soils, which are fragile, to the open countryside, they disappear off the side of the hill by eroding down, um, and they might, some of them might blow away as nurse or windblown soils. So the areas I'm looking at are different, but they're, they're, they're not, they are different not because of the geology, not because of something underlying it. They are different probably because of an ecological quirk. Ecology doesn't happen uh, and create a mat. And I said at the beginning, you know, the, the woodland covered uh, Northwest Europe as a blanket. Well, that's wrong. If you look at any woodland, any mature woodland, it will have patches in it of dense woodland, patches of open woodland. And so we should always be looking at landscapes as mosaics. And what we're now doing as archaeologists is identifying some of those mosaics. But more importantly, some of those mosaics have been absolutely critical because they created huge differences which were absolutely critical to prehistoric people and to animals in the past. So as animals exploited different parts of that in the, in the past, then people exploited those areas and they became the genesis of where some of these archaeological monuments happened. So Stonehenge was chosen, its precise location was chosen precisely by the area in which it sits 
was chosen for the communities because it was open, as with Avebury, as with uh, Cranbourne Chase, and as with the Dorchester environments. So it's a quirk. Had those open areas happened around Devizes or happened around somewhere else uh, or in Wiltshire, in Hampshire or Dorset, we might have got those folk high, though, though uh, starting in different, uh, different places. Right, thank you. Yeah. I'm sure there are lots more questions. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, am I right in thinking that the underlying assumption uh, behind these studies is that snails had fixed habitat preferences for millennia? And what is the independent evidence that that's the case? That's a very good question. The assumption is that the snails we see today and the environment they live in today is the same as the environment they lived in the past. And therefore we can use them as a proxy relative of what they, have, what they lived in the past. And if that assumption is wrong, all of this work is bunkum. So how can we prove that it's right? Well, there are a number of ways we can do it. One is by looking other, with other proxy data. So there are areas where pollen and snails survive, and we can see that our land snail work and our pollen work are creating absolute mirrors. And I've got slides where I can show you the post holes, at, the post pits at Stonehenge, where the land snail and the pollen are providing this interpretation of the same environment um, uh, within, and the changes occur within a centimetre centimet of each other. Um, we can also do it by looking at some uh, ancient isotope work where we can match past environments from the snail shells themselves, showing what type of environment they're living off, what type of vegetation they're eating. Um, but it is not easy. But the general assumption is that on the whole, the land snails live in the same environment that they always have done, as many other invertebrates have also do. Some snails are moving into a different habitats. And the reason they're moving into a different habitat is because they're moving to habitats that never existed. So there are some snails which are um, synanthropic, so which means they like living in humanly made environments, your garden. Some of them like and have adapted to living in your garden. Um, uh, and they like the mixture of the leaves and the broken soil and the different vegetation that you are creating for them. So they are exploiting a new ecological niche that didn't exist before. So on the whole, through thousands of pieces of analysis and thousands of analogies, working with biologists and natural historians and ecologists and paleoecologists, we're fairly confident that we're fairly much on the money because also we're not looking at one snail, we're looking at 118 species of snails. And we're looking at not what one individual snail is doing, but what the whole gamut of snails are doing. So every single assemblage I will look at may contain one or two hundred snails and may contain five, ten, fifteen, twenty or thirty species. Thank you. But that does that apply to the colour morphs of Sapir? No. Stable through time? The colour morphs of Sapir is interesting. At some early on people thought that the, the different morphs were um, climatic um, and certainly there's, there's, there's no doubt that that you get banded, more heavily banded ones on the shadier side of hills than you get uh, less banded ones on the sunnier side. But on the whole, in terms of the broader ecology, they're both exploiting the same ecology, just one is slightly lighter than the other. So the, the, the banding on the sepia now doesn't help me as a paleoenvironmentalist at all. It helps geneticists, but it doesn't help um, in terms of the paleoenvironment because they are both exploiting the same type of environment, which is a long grass, scrubby, Catholic type of environment. Good, thank you very much. What, what about peaty soils in the north and in the Midlands? Um, I presume the snails don't last in those peaty soils, do they? Because they're so acidic. Absolutely right. The, the, the most of the soils, the peat soils in particular, but most sandy soils, uh, and many soils on claylands will support snails to live and you'll still see them there rushing around doing their business eating uh, the vegetation some of them are carnivorous some of them are uh, vegetarian some of them are omnivores and they're eating up bits of the vegetation and so forth and when they die uh, the, the, the body dies and the, the shell is then sitting on and then in the soil but in the peatlands as you quite really say and on the clay soils and the sand soils 
they dissolve fairly rapidly. So all that data is lost and we don't have that data, which is why uh, pollen is so good in that type of a landscape. Um, and the corollary is that on the chalklands, the bizarre thing is that pollen doesn't survive on that, chalk, that type of landscape yeah. and snails do. So it's almost one or the other. There are one or two rare instances where we can find both, or if you have a blooming good pollen analyst, he can get enough data out of some very poor soils. So some of the archeological pollen analysts will get data out of soils that any geographer would not bother dealing with. Um, so it's, it's almost a one or the other. Yeah, you're absolutely right. uh, if I may, I was wondering about the, um, the, the view that you showed at the beginning where there's a, a little settlement um i i don't know whether that's a, a real image but in the background you've got uh, nicely plowed open fields and i was trying to build a mental image of what it would really have looked like whether that would have been forested um from what you're saying there would have been forests nearby i presume they wouldn't want to build a settlement unless there were trees nearby if they're going to require a, a ton of timber a year to uh, to keep the fire going which image are you looking at it's not this uh, one. yes that there you've got right. nicely plowed fields in the okay. background um presumably it would have been this uh, is a photograph well yes but, uh, uh, but and it's a butzer iron age um, oh yes i i know butzer yes this is butzer this is one of the older sites which is i think this was no longer there um mm. and in many ways it's really quite a good example um, because the fields that we can see in the background are huge and much bigger than we'd see in the past. But on the whole, most of those components are elements we would have seen in the past, but in a different scale. So the woodland may have been more open and less managed in terms of we see it today. Today, we can see the edges are abrupt field boundary edges. We can see that the woodland is moving along field boundaries as, as overgrown hedges. So it'd have been much scruffier and the edges would have been less well defined. But yeah, so your question was? Uh, well, the question was, what, what would it look like really? Just trying to build a, a mental image, partly so that I can translate it into what one might see around here in, in the Cotswolds uh, and you know whether the raised ground would have been, I presume generally wooded, but there would have been clearings. And um, I understand that uh, in Sirencester, for example, there was always some sort of village, some sort of uh, settlement there for, you know, way back into prehistory and just trying to uh, okay. uh, that's, imagine that's a what really, it was. Really good question. It's very difficult to answer because one thing which we're trying, which you're glossing over in many ways, is this big thing that archaeologists have to deal with called time. Um, this particular photograph here is looking at the Iron Age. So we're looking at a period um 800 or so bc um and if i then look to the same photograph at 1000 bc or 1500 bc or 2000 bc or 3000 bc we'd be painting different pictures so um it's difficult to consider a landscape as a single instance so we have to look at it uh choose a period but if we looked at the particular landscape you can see in front of us and take that into the bronze age so we say 1500 bc we'd expect to see all the fields being smaller, all the areas being smaller. So if we moved into the Cotswolds, I think we might see field systems which are set up as definite systems. They're quite small, they're easily manageable by a small family group or farm group in a day or so. Um, areas of woodland would not have strong edges to them. They would be bleeding into areas of open pasture. There'd be areas of pasture which wouldn't be just these beautiful mown areas of grassland, they would have hawthorn and shrubs in the middle of them. And what's more is out of those shrubs, maybe growing one or two trees, which may be growing out of the centre. And one of the best things to do if you ever get the chance is to go to sites such as Nep in West Sussex, which is Nep Castle, where they're doing a rewilding project. And there's a book on it by Izzy, uh, Izzy Trees about tree. Um, yeah. and, and that particular landscape is giving you some indication of how the landscape would have looked in the past. Um, and it gives you some instances that if you just leave the countryside to its own devices, areas of brambles will grow up 
you think, oh, they're going to be thickets and they're going to be lost forever. Um, but then trees grow out of the center of those brambles because the animals can't get at any nuts or berries or fruits or seeds that have, have got in there because they're being taken by the brambles. And as the tree grows, it overshades the bramble and kills the brambles. You end up with dark, no grass. And then as it opens up, you end up with grass underneath it. So you can see these are dynamic changing landscapes, even at the micro scale. So the landscapes we're looking at in the past are rougher, uh, are un more untidy, are smaller, um, and edges of, of nature versus man are much less well defined. And yet all the archaeological interpretation we see is even quite clearly as nice, clear pictures, but I think you can see it as much more as man living in a natural landscape rather than man being imposed and creating the landscape. It's only by the time we move to the later periods to the Iron Age and Rome period are we really starting to create and manage the landscape we're starting to see today. Mm. So in fact you've got a blurred edge not only in the three dimensions, well two dimensions I suppose, but but also in the time dimension where yeah. things drift from one to another. Yeah and also we always think things are being progressive in terms of being more and more clear but we can see areas where things have become overgrown We've had barrows overgrown with vegetation, which I said at the beginning, which has given me an indication of the history of that monument in terms of what society's view of that monument is. It wasn't revered. The activity happened, which in that case was um, feasting um, and celebration as a ritual and no burial, and then they went away. So it was a stage for an activity. And once the activity had gone, the monument itself marked that place and then they went away. So there'll be other things in the landscape as a wider picture where vegetations will come and drift and move. Yeah. Mm. And we're getting to the stage in environmental archaeology where instead of saying the general picture whereby in the past it was wooded and then it became more open, that archaeologists are saying, well, what was it like at my site? What was it like here? What was it like over there? And that creates a requirement of having 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 times more data because we not only need it spread over time, but we need it spread over space. And it's that spatial element we're starting to get to grips with. And your question is asking just that, what's happening over space? And that's the questions we're now starting to grapple with. Mm. Mm, thank you. Have you been able to correlate at all your um, environmental pictures with the numbers very indicatively of population? In general terms, we can see that as the areas become more and more open, the population increases. Um, and so because this is the population that is generating that clearance, the increase in population is increasing the openness. And we can see uh, things like that. What we haven't yet done is look for things like, is there a huge increase in clearance? Is there a huge increase in deforestation at any one time, which we can pinpoint is, as being an increase in population? And the problem with tying things up so specifically as that is that's being very one dimensional and saying this clearance and uh, arabalization is a result of um, population when it may be a really a, a change in the economy. If we change our economy, we may have the same number of people, but just doing something in a different way. And so their impact on the landscape may be very different. So in some aspects of the very high level we can see just that but at the more specific landscape level it's very difficult yeah yeah thanks and and, and, and like a good archaeologist when there's a difficult question we shy away from it <laughs> <laughs> right any more questions from anybody anybody there well if if not um in, in my position as chair of the of the Science Society, on behalf of the Science Society, I'd like to thank you very much, Mike. Fascinating talk. Lots, lots more questions, obviously, because the whole thing is exploration, isn't it? Yeah. But thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating, and I've no doubt some of our members would probably like to come along and you know see what you're up to at some stage. Uh, shall I pass pass over to uh, Associate Society? Would you like to also make a comment? Sorry. Uh, it, hello, this is Peter Watkins here on behalf of the Archaeological and Historical Society. Um, very interesting talk. I noticed that at, uh, at peak time we had, uh, I think, 65 participants or perhaps a few more. 
no. which I, I think was very good considering how few we started off with. Um, these are obviously generated rather a large number of questions and I'd like to ask a few more, but I think we ought to uh, uh, stop here. Um, and we'd uh, definitely like to consider your invitation to uh, uh, visit you at some time. So uh, I'd like to thank the Science Society for organising the meeting and using their uh, uh, Zoom facilities. And you very much, uh, uh, Mike, for a very interesting talk. Thank you. No problem at all. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me.